Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Som TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. On today's podcast, I am going to speak with the composer of our new film, Cup of Salvation. He uh, pulled together one of the most beautiful scores I've ever had with a full orchestra, and we're going to talk about wine and music on today's pod. Before we do that, I want to tell everyone. Cup of Salvation is playing in theaters around the country right now. We're about to start playing in Canada and coming up very soon. If you live in the Portland, Oregon area, head down to McMinnville in the Willamette Valley to go to the screening at one of the locations we filmed the film at Mesara Winery. It's going to be incredible. I will be there with the cast doing a QA. and a There's food, there's wine. It's going to be fantastic. Get tickets for that at somfilms.com and all the rest of the screenings New York City is about to announce. Without further ado, my conversation with brilliant composer Alex Monsoor. Alex, it's uh, great to have you back on the Som TV podcast. Uh, the second composer, and it's all, only been you. You're the only composer we talked to on the podcast. It's uh, an honor. Yeah, it's great to have <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, the uh, the film is out. You did the music for Cup of Salvation, and you know we'll try to go light on spoilers for the film. I don't know how you do spoil this film. There's already articles out, but I do want to say. You got to plug the score really fast. It is available. I want to start this off with people can get the score, which is just a tremendous monumental piece of work. I'm so proud to have it in a movie that I directed. Where can people get the score? Uh, it's so kind of you, Jason. The The score is out, uh, out now, I believe, uh, on any of your streaming platforms. So Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora. Uh, it's about 15 tracks long, around 50 minutes or so. Um, features orchestra, Jazz, improvising, um, deduk, uh, all sorts of music on the score. Quite a, a wide range of, of listening experience. It's beautiful music. I am honestly, it's one of the main things people walk out of the film and they say that film wasn't very good, but the music was really good. That's what I hear. I don't think you're. <laughs> I don't think anyone is hearing that. Set the record straight. They are definitely. But. So, all right. So I want to talk. Let's, let's start with wine here. Okay, just really fast. When you do a wine movie and I've now done several of them, you have this issue of wine is very exciting in a lot of cases because you sit down at a table, you and I are drinking a glass of bubbles right now, and you talk to somebody, and it's really the people that sort of provide the excitement for wine, and when you leave, you're like, that wine was amazing. I find wine films to be one of the most challenging subjects that I've ever directed because wine doesn't move. You know, I've said this many times on the podcast. And so when I make these films, it's not just in a normal film, often a director's secret weapon is the score for emotion, for other things. But in a wine film, it is astronomically more important. I mean, you were, a, you were able to do things in this movie. Uh, there's a lot of tension. It's, you know, borders on a geopolitical thriller at points. That's a father-daughter, you know, kind of emotional. You were able to do things that are tremendous. I want to ask you, what is your relationship with wine, if any? Have you did you ever expect to work on a wine film? You've now done two movies with me. One was a food film, The Whole Animal, mm-hmm. and now you've done a wine film. This, Yeah, this is my first wine film. Uh, I am not terribly knowledgeable about wine. Uh, I do enjoy a glass of wine. Uh, when I've had wine, it has been in, well, I suppose, in, in either a religious setting or a social setting, starting in, in college on. So uh, I... I have learned a lot more about wine since meeting you and watching the Psalm films and watching Cup of Salvation. Though when I watched Cup of Salvation too, it, it absolutely is a wine film, but I think my mind immediately gravitated towards those other elements that you were talking about, that it's a family film and it's a, an adventure film and a, a heist film. And, um, <laughs> and of course, all those things are, are related to the wine and wine is, I mean, that's what the film is about. That wine is everything, you know, it's... Um, but yeah, my experience, my relationship is mostly social, mostly positive. I would love to develop a, a more sophisticated understanding of it. So you might have to give me some tips. But You're in the best place ever. People who don't know a lot about wine probably are the most open and welcoming and sometimes uh, the best to receive wine. You know, the more you learn, the more you realize there's, you'll never learn everything. But you go through various stages of being jaded about something, coming back to it, thinking, you know, I need stuff with age, or then you go, you know, some people go into natural wine, then they swing back. And the interesting thing for you is it's all wine. And that's a very good place to be. Now, talking about this film, which I know many people listening to this, I, I see your messages. I know not everybody has seen it. And we're we're going, we're going across the country into Canada. We're going to hit Europe. And then it will go to digital. Stay tuned to Som TV, obviously, for everybody. But 
This was a challenging movie to, to write music for, wasn't it? It was and it wasn't. You know, I I think it was challenging in a lot of ways in the sense that there's a lot the music has to do. It has to propel the story. It has to somehow interact with these, these rich locations and cultures. Um, we had to do it rather quickly. Um, <laughs> we produced it. And we, you know, we gave ourselves a a challenging tall order in that we were going to record an orchestra. Um, we were going to record uh, a quartet of real improvised instruments. We're real talking instruments, about a yeah. real orchestra. So the choice to do that makes adds a ton of factors, um, or just a ton of logistical things that, that need to happen. But generally, though, I, I would say that it wasn't difficult in the sense that when I when the film arrived to me, it was largely it was made. You know, the film was was edited. Um, there was music in it that was doing already a lot of what I think you all had hoped music would do. So as a composer, hearing that and kind of understanding me, like, oh, okay, that's what we're going to try this kind of thing or that kind of thing. And of course, we end up doing some different things. And then largely just to your credit, to Sarah, the editor's credit, John Adams, sound designs, mix, everyone is just so easy to work with and generous creatively and and very clear with, you know, direction and what we're hoping to make. So from that end, one of the easiest processes I've had. This is good. I've been torturing Alex now for a couple months, and I'm glad to see that the Stockholm <laughs> yes. syndrome is working. Yes. This is good. Yeah. The uh, when, when I, you know, when you deliver a film, for those of you interested in the process of how this goes, you temp it with different music. And if you think about like wine in a barrel, nothing's fully integrated. You put You put wine in a barrel, and all the tannins and all the acid and all the alcohol and all of the things are just sort of floating and they're not sitting together. And as it ages and macerates and does what it's supposed to do, and even sometimes after bottling, a film like Alex Scott is like that. Nothing is, the film is there, like you said. There's still the characters, the themes, they're all there. But I'm using music from six, seven, eight different films, pieces of score from around the world. They don't blend. And when the final step, when you get an original score, especially one that's done with real instruments like you did, it is literally like, going from a barrel sample and going, this wine is going to be good, to this is a 10-year-old aged bottle that is ready to drink now. And it's it's that quick with a film. It's just the fact that you can do that, do it, <laughs> you had to do this in like four weeks. <laughs> well, I, I think, we, you know, I don't know if this would work for the wine analogy, but at least with writing music, producing music, it's kind of a gift to, you know, the necessity of and the imposing deadline, you know, it, it forces you to to work quickly. And I, I'm someone that benefits, I think, a little bit from not overthinking, um, just having this target to hit of we need to be finished by this date and working backwards from there, what do we need to do in order to meet that? So in that regard, I think sometimes it forces just ideas to flow quickly. There's not time to to wait around for for inspiration, so to speak. Um, no, I will say, and I don't even know if you remember this, I, I suspect you do, that about a year ago, I, th- I want to say in 2022, summer of 2022, um, we had done the whole animal maybe six months prior. You had sent me some material from Cup of Salvation, and I had written a little reaction to it. So I remember looking at that, and that material actually became the, the music that's in the end credits. So I already had... I'd say like some 50% of thematic material, meaning the the melodies that you might hear in the, the movie, um, came from that initial piece. So some writing had already been done. And I remember through that year, you know, reading articles and being aware of Cup of Salvation. So it wasn't entirely a surprise or, or yeah. you know, I think the the deadline did, you know, the when I got your call <laughs> saying we're, it's time to go. Let's start soon, and we're going to theaters in like five weeks or something crazy yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, you were you were gracious about it. I, I think you said, "Can we can we make this happen?" <laughs> uh, to which uh, I was very game to to do. So you know, when you do this process of making a film, especially a documentary, you're fighting against. You have no money. You have no time. And then all of a sudden, the whip cracks, and you can't really you can't let those things stop you from getting it out. We went for an awards qualification, slim shot, but a shot. And uh, in order to do that, you have to go to an actual theater in Los Angeles. You have to play multiple times a day for an entire week. You got to qualify for the awards, and we did that. And so you met a deadline, and you know we're still catching up on press and all the stuff because we were so far behind the eight ball. This film has a lot of different things that happen in it, and this is not a spoiler to say some of the settings of the film. I mean, you can read it in articles. We filmed in Armenia, and there's a lot of history. We filmed in what is. At this moment, the oldest winery in the world, it's in a cave. It's this incredible archaeological site that they are rediscovering a lot of human history on a daily basis in. 
And then we filmed during a war, you know, and the movie wasn't supposed to be what it is. We just got caught during a war. And then we filmed in Iran. And that is one of the things that I don't think saying that spoils the movie in any way, shape, or form. It's how it happens that you need to see. How do you approach such a wide berth of scenarios? And then there are some touching moments in this film. How in the world do you even begin to look at this process when you have to go, here's a deep historical film. Here is a film that involves potential combat and our main characters are stuck in the middle of it. And then a heist in Iran and then bringing it all from, how do you do this? Well, I think, yeah, trying to take all that in at once can be crippling and paralyzing and even a feature film at all, you know, just thinking of some 75 minutes of, of movie and music that you might have to, uh, to, to write and get through. That is a tall order that I think, you know, that blank page, blinking cursor, in my case, empty staves, you know, of music paper, um, very easy to just want to, to not know where to start. But um, generally, I find looking at pieces scene by scene, or what we would call cue by cue, uh, cues of music, um, take just looking at a scene and asking what does this scene need, there's definitely a spectrum of of scale in this music. Some pieces of music are only two instruments, you know, maybe some only piano, um, some piano and bass. Some cues are the whole orchestra, five improvisers playing at the same time in, in addition. So uh, even within the music, there is a range. But definitely we want there to be that cohesion, that blend you mentioned earlier. And I think that, in this case at least, there are many ways to do this, but in our case, um, we went for a melodic or um, leitmotivic, uh, thematic kind of approach. So there's a music, there's a theme for our main characters, Amy and Vahe. Um, there's a motif for discovery or um, that ancient winery Jason was mentioning in the cave that becomes a place where we hear a, a theme, a melody that we use to evoke a sense of culture or craft at other points in the movie. Having your building blocks of material, that that is necessary. And then from there, cue by cue, you might need to, you know, there are all these targets you have to hit in terms of narrative, in terms of uh, is this tense, is it uh, sad, is it you know, whatever emotional language you want to use, and then making sure that piece of music can maybe flow through different, you know, environments, different psychological environments like that in a piece that still is cogent and feels like an organic piece of music. So just to answer your question, though, yeah, scene by scene, little bits at a time, two minutes a day or so. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to learn more, I mean, just in practicing more and more of, like, how do you tackle that, the arc of a feature? Um, you know, because ideally, you know, you look, you take a step back and you watch this long-form piece of uh, of art, and it feels like, it unfolds naturally on that macro level. And I think that is a little bit intangible and difficult to nail. But I think some of it can deal with, uh, you know, planting seeds, planting little musical clues of things that aren't necessarily entirely uh, stated at the beginning and then developing them into something that blossoms at the end. I think our score definitely does tend to scale as it goes on, though, you know, there are definitely moments early on that are quite dramatic and dynamic as well. Um, I, I think what happens in the Middle East is incredibly tense. And I think, you know, it's a very different thing to watch somebody walk into a building without that music. And then when you walk into a building hearing that music, it is very tense, very, very tense. And especially considering when you think this is for bunches of grapes, you know, the when you boil it down, it's for fruit. And yet when you're seeing what happens and because of your score, it is, you know, life or death. And it really was. But let's just geek out for one second. What movies and scores inspired you on this particular film, Cup of Salvation? Well, it's great for me as a director. Sure. Whenever you like this? It's rare that a host is also the director, so. <laughs> sure. Well, um, I think. I mean, there are so many. I I don't know with this process. I will just say, I, I think this film generally had less reference in my mind than others that I've worked on, in the sense that once we started going... I really wasn't thinking so much about other films as much as... So I, I think when someone listens to this, they might hear, you know, really uh, quite a, a wide array of, of influence. Um, that being said, I, I think we started from looking at uh, Terrence Blanchard, at Alexander Desplat and Syriana. Um, Terrence Blanchard being mainly known as Spike Lee's yes, composer. Yes, yeah. um, To Five Bloods and... Um, 
uh, 25th Hour. Inside Man, 25th Hour, all of that stuff. Very booming jazz. He's a guy that can do orchestral booming jazz, and it's somebody I, I admire deeply. Well, I, and I think, yeah, what you just hit on, um, especially with 25th Hour, is his wonderful synthesis of the rhythm section. I mean, when I say rhythm section, I'm referring to what in the jazz world would be a piano, a bass, and a drum. That trio tends to make, and sometimes a guitar. That is what is a rhythm section. Um, so we recorded that ensemble with a trumpet and a French horn as well. But what Blanchard does so well is that ensemble being part of the orchestra for these pieces of music to be weaving from one world into the next. And I don't even know that I would say it feels, jazz is such a vague word, you know. Um, jazz could mean bebop. Um, it could mean Ornette Coleman free abstract improvisation. It could mean just, you know, sometimes when people hear a, a trumpet with a mute on it, that sounds jazzy to them. It's, it's very vague, but... Um, he certainly does have a rich background as a as a jazz musician. Um, I should also just say, maybe just because we haven't mentioned it yet, the the idea with the rhythm section here was to pay homage to, or at least to recognize that while Cup of Salvation can be viewed as a standalone film, it is a psalm film um, nonetheless. So, um, and those uh, early psalm films with Brian Carmody's jazz score um, are are so fantastic, and we wanted to make sure. Yeah, again, without spoilers, when we go to Napa in this film or, or uh, New York City, that um, that we have that element in there. But there's another score I really love. Um, it's um, a John Williams score um, for uh, Clint Eastwood's um, The Iger Sanction. Yeah, you played, you played this for me when we were talking about music. Yeah, I think that's another great example of orchestra and rhythm section. But um, generally, I don't know. I'm, I grew up, I loved... Harry Gregson Williams, Hans Zimmer, The Rock, um, and uh, you want Gladiator. To talk about the, the Rock, this is the best. Well, these these I'm trying to think of these these sort of huge epics, these score Ridley Scott films, you know, uh, even The Prince of Egypt, which is a Hans Zimmer score. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, there are moments in this film where I think the percussion and uh, the use of Daduk or um, Ine or, or Armenian or Iranian. Um, woodwinds, for example, evoke those scores to me, but there are also moments where it might feel like um, like a Bourne film, like a like a John Powell score or like a, a James, Jason Bourne film. Huh? I, I like that. Jason, That's a huge compliment. That's, well, especially when we're in Iran and uh, thinking of long stretches of of scenes that are uh, you know seven to ten minutes long, where tension needs to never relent, um, yeah. where, uh, but it still needs to feel like something's escalating. I love it. So somebody right now is listening to this going. I thought they were going to talk about Pinot Grigio or something. You know, I, I've let you down. I'm <laughs> no, sorry. you, you yeah. have not let me down at all. This is, look, we have spent our entire careers trying to take wine, put it at the center of the table, and tell stories around it. And nothing, there is not a single thing on earth that goes together, besides maybe sex, than music and wine. Mm. You know, wine goes the best with music. And the two are so important together. And I know a lot of people that are pairing wine and music, both from a classical, uh, hip-hop, all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it works really well if you know how to talk about both of those things. Mm -hmm. And music is talked about in a very similar way. You talk about, you know, right now you're talking about John Williams, you're talking about different scores and orchestrations. That's the exact same conversation you have with somebody about the way wine is vinified and the way grapes are managed or, or farmed or whatever else. They're the same language. And right. it doesn't sound like it, but they really are because every single little choice you make impacts the levels above and below and then it impacts the future and the past. And so it's a very interesting process to talk about music. Mm -hmm. So for those of you wishing we were talking about Pinot Grigio, we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we definitely are. To, to add on to that, I was thinking while watching the film a lot, of, you know, these processes that take a long time to realize, these, these wines that... Um, that age and um, a vine that is fighting to to survive and um, thinking about instruments themselves and this might tie into how we actually produced and recorded the score. But when you choose to to record live musicians, uh, you know a musician shows up to the recording session with their instrument. And for example, my cello is a German instrument and it was made in the 30s. So way older than I am, way more experienced than I am, has seen pre World War II in yeah, Germany. Jesus. Yeah. And so to imagine, for example, then eight cellos, or, or uh, in our case, we had four cellos in our cello section. We had, you know, 23 string players total. Um, all those different instruments made by different makers all around the world. That unique blend of them, the player themselves, in this case, uh, from Budapest, Hungarian musicians, though I would imagine well-traveled, you know, potentially musicians that have uh, lived all over the world just happen to be working in Hungary right now. We're talking about a synthesis of, of influence and culture 
and just, I mean, it's it's impossible to wrap your head around what that means. But I'm particularly fascinated, yeah, in instruments themselves and how they change over time, how the right player in the right instrument is a different kind of expression than anything else. I, it sounds similar, as naive as I am, to maybe pairing the right wine with the right meal, certain, um, you know, similarly, as certain people having a proclivity for certain drinks. Actually, I think that's very well said and very, very, very true. Without trying to spoil the film, what is your favorite piece of music that you did in regards to, because like we said, I mean, there are, I don't want to call it Mission Impossible or something like that. There are sections in this that are like a Ridley Scott film. Very big, very grand, very epic. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I just mean in its thematicness. What was your favorite? I think there are a handful that get at different things. I mean, there's a track on the soundtrack um, called 17,000 Bottles, which takes place at a climactic moment in the film. I enjoy that as a listen because it goes through different territories. Um, it's perhaps a synthesis of those different musical elements we were talking about. Um, in the film, there's a there's a moment where that track culminates that is it's a really kind of fun, badass, victorious moment for that character as he's as he's doing something really cool. There's another track on there called uh, Farming This Land, which plays uh, when, uh, well, I, I don't even know how to describe it, uh, but when a bike is riding up a, a, a mountain, a motorcycle is going up a mountain. That's my favorite cue in the movie. Uh, uh, Hands down. I'm glad really, that's sweet of you. Um, that takes place in the Middle East. I'll just say that. Something, something. And that, that's one, to be honest, that is kind of adjacent to the rest of the score. It's not really playing any of the melodies too much, but it features um, uh, a horn player named Adam Wolf, who's been a longtime fan of the Psalm films as well as a, a, a wine lover himself. And uh, he wrote to me uh, some time ago after seeing The Whole Animal, and we'd been wanting an opportunity to work together. Uh, so that's an example, for example, where I knew there was a musician, there was an individual who I wanted to make sure we could feature here. And that was very inspiring as a composer to think, who is the player going to be? Um, I don't know much about his instrument, for example, not the horn, but like his specific horn. Um, but just the idea of casting while you're writing of who's going to play this eventually and how can we... So th that, that piece kind of uh, came out of nowhere, but is one that I look back on and enjoy. But I, I think the album is a fun listen in the sense that there are so many different types of music in this. You know, for example, I think the, the eighth or ninth track is called um, Protecting the Vineyard. That is a piece that's quite emotional and um, dramatic and orchestral, and then it goes right into Napa, which is swinging and you know Dave Brubeck kind of uh, mm -hmm. you st you, uh, tap your feet and go and have a have a cold drink. I think in terms of um, variety, it, and this is a testament to your directing and just what the film needed, you know, it, the music is really allowed to follow the action and um, you're never afraid for the music to be engaging in 
in the conversation with the characters and to, to really be a character of its own. Um, I've, opposed, ne- I've never yeah. told you to go smaller. I don't, I don't think maybe like once or twice. And then, and then I would always go back and go, you were right in the first place. Let's go bigger. So I, I think that you have a, not many people can pull that off though, from a composer standpoint where you can be such a big presence in a film without completely overtaking the film. And, I think there are a few directors who try it. Noel, Christopher Nolan does it, and it works. But he is not afraid for his music to be as big a character as Matthew McConaughey is in Interstellar. The, mu- sure. the That giant organ playing in Interstellar is right there with Matthew McConaughey. So yeah. it's just an interesting perspective to to play it that way. Luckily, you're good enough that it works. Well, that's nice of you. I, I, I would also say I think the film invites it. You know, I think some films invite it more than others. Um, I was watching the other day... Um, Punch Drunk Love, um, Paul Thomas Anderson film, which has a John Bryan score. Yep, John Bryan. And yeah. The way with he that, uses with that music, tacky, get the tacky piano. The uh, yeah, the uh, oh, yeah, it's the har- harmonier, I think. Uh, harmonium. What is that? Called? Or it might be a harmonium. Uh, yeah. yeah, but um, that score often is. It's like a toy piano almost. It's like a little toy piano, yeah. like in its size at least. Right, he finds it on the street. Yep. And, um, and there's this percussion kind of electronic music that plays in these long tracking shots where this character is just on the phone. He's getting more and more stressed. Very stressful. That but, score and it's is very loud stressful. in the mix. It's really, I think, designed to to stress you as the viewer out. By your brain is trying to process the music and well, the narrative information. Not also. to hijack this is a P.T. Anderson, but I mean, you know, There Will Be Blood is probably the ultimate film where the score is like sitting next to you in the theater mm-hmm. and like whispering in your ear, and you're like, "Hey, hold on, I'm trying to watch the movie." Yeah. But like, it works and yeah. it's great, and it Daniel Day Lewis's performance in that film doesn't work without the music. I. You know, I just have to say, like, a lot of these things are not, you're not supposed to know you're being manipulated. You're supposed to, like, you know, most of the time you hear a car drive or you hear footsteps. Those are not real. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to know the sound designer did that. If he did his job, you don't know those chickens making that noise are fake noises. Mm -hmm. But I feel opposite about scoring. In a lot of cases, that's the case. You don't want to notice the score. You want it to swell. You want to feel emotion and you want it to go away. And the audience doesn't think about the score. Mm -hmm. I like people leaving my films going... I remember music. Mm. And that's happened for all the screenings. You know, LA, Chicago, we were just up in Napa. We have a lot more coming. Uh, that has been a topic of conversation. People were like, holy shit, how do I get this music? Oh, that's very And flattering. I'm going to tell you, plug yeah. it right now one more time. We can get it where? This everywhere. is uh, Spotify. Song Cup of Salvation, yeah, on November 3rd. Uh, oh, the, this will be out then. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, so Spotify, Apple Music, mm-hmm. Amazon Music. Amazon Music, I think uh, it'll be on YouTube too. Uh, but yeah, pretty much all the streaming platforms and I was. I think. Yeah, the film invited it in the sense that this film is is about adventure. And the first of all, the, the cinematography in this film is striking. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. It's very inspiring. And in that sense, it, the visuals are telling you that the music needs to follow suit. But just also in terms of implying some of the things that you can't see. You know, for example, in Iran, it is harrowing. It is life and death, like Jason was saying. But visually, by nature of documentary, you know, we're we're watching a character, you know, walk around a lot in shaky cam, and uh, there's not um, the music needs to imply the danger that is not being represented sure. on yep. screen, um, yep. which does invite that. Uh, similarly, with some of the more emotional bits or um, adventurous bits. Um, yeah, you did a you did a very good job on this. I mean, I know the people. Hopefully, the people listening to this have not seen the film. This makes you want to see it more. Hopefully, the people listening who have seen it want to see it again. But the score is a really important part of this, and you're sort of like I hate to put any pressure on you, but you're my lucky charm. You know, you did uh, you did Whole Animal, and we won the James Beard Award. We beat, oh my gosh. you know, we beat that's Netflix too much pressure. And other stuff. So, you know, hopefully, this film, uh, you know, wins the Pulitzer or something. <laughs> you know, is that a possibility? Do films win the Pulitzer? I don't think so. No. <laughs> well, I'm I was so honored to be asked to do this. I mean, this the the story this film tells is very important, especially right now, and with you know, a few things that are happening in the world that uh, it, it comments directly on. Um, also, just the idea of watching a family, um, this father-daughter relationship, and the what they allowed, what they put themselves through in order to pursue something greater than themselves. Uh, you know, this, this culture reviving this ancient tradition is um, absolutely inspiring, and they are so charismatic, so likable. I know they've been at some of the screenings. I'm sure the audiences have loved getting to hear directly from them. Oh, uh, absolutely. Alex, I want to thank you enormously. I want to tell everybody, go and stream this, the the score. We'll have news on the film coming digitally, but until then, 
Seek out on somfilms.com for a screening. And uh, if you're a Som TV subscriber, we will let you know very soon when you can watch Cup of Salvation and the many, many, many hours of bonus features and other documentaries coming around it. Alex, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I cannot wait to make another film with you. Oh, thank you, Jason. I want to thank everybody for listening. It means a lot. I want to thank John Adams for producing this podcast and Alex Monsoor for being on. Uh, I really, really am excited for all of you to see Cup of Salvation. For those of you who have, thank you for the great response. It's been tremendous. Uh, go to somfilms.com to get your tickets. New York will be announcing, and Oregon is going to be very, very special. We will talk soon. Be safe and have a glass for me.